Well, folks, uh, you know, you don't have to stand. Every time I hear hail to the chief, wonder, where the hell is he? <laughs> Took me a long while. <laughs> you think I'm joking? I'm not. Turn around and where, where's, where's the president? <laughs>
but it's nutty in the way that everything's nutty, right? You wake up every morning and you go, okay, what's gonna be nutty today? Boys or girls, girls or boys, two plus two is five, blah, 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 nothing makes sense. We don't know anything that we knew that was obvious two years ago. So they had this big Senate hearing yesterday to review the uh, reversal of Roe v. Wade. And a whole bunch of senators were up there, senators on both sides of the aisle, by the way, and they get to call out, uh, they get to call on experts, law professors, scientists, et cetera, to share their opinions on this reversal of Roe v. Wade. So one of the people that was called upon was a UC Berkeley law professor by the name of Kiara Bridges. And she was questioned uh, by Senator Josh Hawley from Missouri. Uh, Professor Bridges, you said several times, you've used a phrase, I wanna make sure I understand what you mean by it. You've referred to people with a capacity for pregnancy. It, would that be women? Many women, cis women, have the capacity for pregnancy. Many cis women do not have the capacity for pregnancy. Um, there are also trans men who are capable of pregnancy, as well as non-binary people who are capable of pregnancy. So this isn't really a women's rights issue. It's a, it's, we can it's recognize a that this impacts women while also recognizing that it impacts other groups. Those things are not mutually exclusive, Senator Hawley. Oh, so your view is, is that the core of this, this right then is about what? So um, I want to recognize that your line of questioning um, is transphobic, <laughs> um, and it opens up trans people to violence by not recognizing that. Wow, you're saying that I'm opening up people to violence by asking whether or not women are the folks who can have pregnancies? Because denying that trans people exist and pretending not to know that they exist I'm is denying that trans people exist by asking are you? you if you're talking are you? about women are you? having pregnancies. Do you believe that the, uh, men can get pregnant? No, I don't think women can get <laughs> So you pregnant. are denying that trans people exist? Like and that leads to violence? Is this how you run your classroom? Are students allowed to question you? Absolutely. Or are they also treated like this? Where no, you, no, no, they're, they're told that to they're at, opening up people to oh, violence. We have a good time in my class. You should join. Oh, I bet. You might learn a lot. Wow. I, I... Ah, this is what's going on in our government and our halls of higher education. Okay, so let's do the obvious part first. You guys can see this woman, who again is a UC. Berkeley professor. Now, UC Berkeley used to be an actual place of higher education. Berkeley in the 60s and 70s was the home. It really was the educational home of the free speech movement in America when liberals used to care about free speech. Believe it or not, they did a long time ago. Check out the ACLU back in the 60s and 70s. I know it's a far cry from what it is today. Uh, but she is a professor at UC Berkeley, which is now a hotbed of woke, progressive, radical leftism insanity. All he basically is saying there is the obvious thing. We know that it's women who get pregnant. Everyone knows it. It is women who get pregnant. Dudes cannot get pregnant. The idea that I even have to say that, that you even have to watch something to hear that, that the government has to spend time on this, that there are professors teaching these things, shows you how how they've dragged us. They've just dragged us to this endless abyss. That woman is not a defender of women. She's a defender of craziness, of, of some sort of real bizarro nonsense. Like she's a defender of a political ideology more than women. All he's saying is, hey, is it just women that can get pregnant? And we all know that. We all know that, okay? I can't get pregnant. I cannot get pregnant. You, can you get pregnant? That dude can't get pregnant. You, can you get pregnant? He wasn't sure. You? Okay, yes, he said yes. All right, well, I'm gonna have to talk to you. The point is, guys can't get pregnant. I've enjoyed my time on YouTube, but there I said it. It's also stupid. And then, of course, what she says is, if you even question my insane logic on this, you are transphobic. Now, let's just talk about the word phobic for a second, because a phobia is an irrational fear an irrational fear. To question this professor's feelings on gender ideology means that Josh Hawley has an irrational fear of trans people, meaning if there was a trans person walking down the street, and by the way, sometimes a trans person's walking down the street and you don't know that he would have an irrational fear and he would run the other way. Now, of course, that's nonsense. And of course, it's also nonsense that that is causing violence. By the way, I'll even go a step further. If Josh Hawley, who's been on this show, if Josh Hawley was pushing for some sort of law in Missouri that was gonna criminalize 
uh, people being trans, meaning once you're an adult and able to make medical decisions for yourself and live as you wish, if he was criminalizing that in any way, if he was ensuring that these people couldn't get jobs or couldn't get proper medical attention or anything like that, I would be 100% without equivocation against Josh Hawley and that bill. I believe in equal rights for everybody, but equality doesn't guarantee, doesn't, isn't automatically connected to you having to be an idiot. And that is what these people seemingly have connected everything to. So Josh Hawley is a transphobe. He is causing violence against, the, against these people. And again, who is more into science? Is it this professor who teaches this stuff? Or is it the guy who's like, yeah, uh, I think girls can get pregnant. And I don't think boys can. Which one is it? Well, it continued. Kiara continued. Here she is clashing with Senator John Cornyn. Uh, about human life and the origins of human life. Uh, Senator John Cornyn from Texas, of course. Do you think a, a baby that is delivered alive has value? Yes. Do you think that a, um, a, a baby that is not yet born has value? I believe that a person with a capacity for pregnancy has value. They have intelligence, they have agency, they no, have I'm dignity. talking about the baby. And I'm talking about the person with the capacity for and I'm, pregnancy. You're not answering the question. I'm asking. I'm, you I'm, think answer, that a, I'm answering you, a more interesting you think question that, to you me. You think that a baby that is not yet born, let's say the day before this mother delivers, do you think that baby has value? I think that the person with the capacity for pregnancy has value and they, have the, they should have the ability to control what happens to their lives. Well, man, I don't know what to call these people other than a death cult. They really are. Now, first off, uh, the fact that she calls a woman, and it is only women who can give birth. It's only women with uteruses and eggs and all of that stuff, vaginas and all that. Um, <laughs> I'm blowing minds today. I really am. Um, the fact that she calls them uh, a person with the capacity for pregnancy. And this, she, this woman, I have no doubt, calls herself a feminist. Right? She's a feminist. She is a modern feminist. She is for the female, except she probably doesn't know what a female is because she's not a biologist. And when she refers to women, she refers to them in the most sort of psychotically clinical terms, a person with the capacity for pregnancy. Uh, but what's really more perverse and why this really is a death cult, and I say this as someone that still, after all of this nonsense and all of the craziness of the last couple of years, I still consider myself begrudgingly pro-choice. You guys know my feelings on this. Hopefully you've read my books. I do not deny when the egg meets the sperm, that is the moment of life, that that moment of conception is the beginning of everything. But I fundamentally believe there's a difference between splitting of cells over a series of time uh, before you have uh, functioning organs and all of those things. But we can all get into our own philosophical beliefs on this and our own religious beliefs on this and how do you balance all of those things with living in a purely secular society and, and states' rights and all that. Okay, I know you guys get all that. Uh, but what they can no longer do, these radical, woke, progressive, crazy people, what they can no longer do is say anything honest. She knows, she knows that an eight-month, eight-month fetus of course, is a living human being. We know that at 24 weeks, babies can now live outside of the womb. So I think it's happened even a little bit before that. Um, the idea that at eight months, this isn't, I, right now, right at this very moment, I have a surrogate who has an eight month baby. I, I'm gonna be a dad in about a month from now, it's crazy. Uh, but there is a woman who has a child in her that is obviously a living child. These people who are, they're not for women, they're not for children, they are not for humans, and they're not for logic and reason and anything else. But she continued. Here she is going ballistic on Senator Ted Cruz from Texas and Mike Lee from Utah. Senator Lee, Senator Cruz have talked about, oh, this decision just to turn, uh, this uh, Dobbs decision just returned to, to the, the elected representatives of states to, and people can battle it out in these laboratories of democracy as to whether they want to protect fetal life over the interest of, of the pregnant person. These are the same states that are stopping people from voting. Texas has the most restrictive voting laws on the books. Texas's SB8 doesn't represent the will of the majority of Texans. Texas SB8 represents the will of the majority of Texans that were able to vote. 
So in order for this to be a democracy, we have to protect voting rights. And I, I leave it to um, everyone in this, in this room, as well as the rest of Congress, to protect voting rights so that we can be a real democracy. Ah, now you see what it's all about. And this is what intersectionality is all about. This is what wokeism is all about and modern progressivism is all about. It's combining a jillion issues that have nothing to do with each other in a, such a way that you can actually topple democracy so that you can topple our system and fight it from the inside. That's what this is really about. Because first off, the Dobbs decision, whether you are 100% pro-choice or 100% pro-life. The Dobbs decision did exactly what she described right there, which is what Ted Cruz and Mike Lee were saying. All it did was kick it back to the states. And then, yes, you get this, this laboratory of democracy, this ongoing experiment where people on the ground can make decisions about their lives. And if they don't like it in one place, they can go somewhere else. Or if they do like it elsewhere, they can go there. I mean, this is a beautiful thing. This is a beautiful, precious thing that we have here that most countries don't have, that most people in other places in the world would love to have. Because if you live in most other Western democracies, you have a government that basically runs the whole show. But here, although we, we often give too much power to the to the federal government, we have a system of states' rights, so things are extremely different depending on where you live. I used to live in California, an evil dystopian place with high taxes and crime and drugs everywhere. Now I live in the free state of Florida. It's very, very different and feels like living in a different country. Okay, so she says that, uh, but then of course she links this to voting rights, and that's what they do, because they're only in this for the destruction of everything. There is no buddy in Texas that is a legal citizen of Texas that cannot vote. When she talks about restrictive voting rights in Texas, she's saying things like IDs. But why does it, why is it that a certain set of people don't want voter ID? Why do progressives not want voter ID? Because they want to cheat. It's the only answer. It is the only answer. When I lived in Cali, I did not have to show an ID to vote. I literally had to say my name and my address. I could have walked into the same polling place the very next day with another pollster there and I know my neighbor's name and I know my neighbor's address and I could have voted as my neighbor. That's what they want there. Why would they want that? Do you think they might want to screw around with the ballots? Why is it in California when you have a mail-in ballot, as we had during the recall for Gavin Newsom, that no matter which way you folded the envelope, and I tried this even though I voted in person because they also send you the mail-in, no matter which way you folded the envelope, you could either see yes or no on recall on one side or Larry Elder's name on the other just by taking the envelope and holding it up to basic light, basic sunlight, right? You didn't even have to use an iPhone camera or an iPhone flashlight for it. They want this craziness. There is nobody, again, nobody, nobody, and that's why she can't reference anything. These restrictive voting rights, uh, these restrictive voting bills in Texas, they're stopping people. No, they're not. They're not stopping anyone from voting. When you, when you, what you guys mean by restrictive is legal meaning that there should be some paper trail. We should pay attention to who's voting. Make sure that you are who you say you are. But she somehow is combining this into transphobia and the patriarchy and all of these things because that's all these people got. They got a bunch of crazy stuff. But if you think that is crazy, if you think hearing that woman is nuts, I'm gonna show you uh, Mazzy Hirono first in a moment. This was the woman. She is the senator from uh, Hawaii and she is just insane. And we're going to destroy, you know, we're going to destroy Mazzy Hirono today. You guys want to destroy Mazzy Hirono? We're going to destroy Mazzy Hirono. Uh, but first, guys, real quick, let me talk about Liquid IV. I love Liquid IV. And I had some this morning because I ate the chicken fingers. I had a beer and a margarita at the game last night. And, you know, in the hot summer months here in Florida, uh, you need to be proactive about your body and stay hydrated. Making hydration a priority can help us feel healthier in our everyday lives. One stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water hydrates you two times faster and more efficiently than water alone. Plus, liquid IV tastes great with 10 refreshing flavors like Concord Grape, Lemon Lime, Pina Colada, and Tropical Punch. Sounds like summer, doesn't it? I used liquid IV last night after coming back from the game, as I just said, and I feel good and I'm sharp today. Wouldn't you guys say I'm sharp? Very sharp today. Pina Colada is my favorite personally, but you guys can have whatever you want. Grab your liquid IV uh, uh, in bulk 
nationwide at Costco, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code Ruben at checkout. That's 25% off anything you order when you shop for better hydration today using promo code Ruben, liquidiv.com. And now back to me. All right, let's destroy, let's play, let's destroy Hawaii Senator Mazzy Hirono. Here's Mazzy at this hearing yesterday, and she doesn't know what the founders thought. She doesn't know why she has a job. She doesn't even know what she's doing in that room. Originalism, they, uh, the justices who take that approach go all the way back to our founding fathers and pretend that they know what our founding fathers meant when they drafted the Constitution. I use the word pretend because who the heck would, should, would, would know what our founding fathers meant? Um, is there any reference to AR-15 rifles in our Constitution? This is actually one of the most extraordinary things I think that has ever been said by a sitting senator in any one of these hearings or in any cable news interview or anywhere else, that we should have no idea what the founding fathers meant. How would we know that stuff was written hundreds of years ago? Those guys had white wigs on their head and wore funny socks. How would we have any sense what these people were doing? We're very advanced now with our tweeter machine and all of those things. Well, Mazzy Hirono, I'm going to destroy you right now because we did our research and we found some writings from these old people with their white wigs and their funny socks. And I thought I would read to you some of the things that they said way back when, because they were pretty well thought out and they did an awful lot of research and they seriously thought of the, not only of the issues of the day, but how issues over generations and over long periods of time would often reoccur and how we could best protect the individual's right to live freely. So here we got a little something. Mazzy, I don't know if you've heard of this thing. There's something called the Constitution. It's the founding document of the United States. And I thought I'd read you a little bit of the preamble of the Constitution. And maybe we can figure out what these old white guys in white wigs and funny socks, and some of them a little portly uh, due to the, the diet at the time, uh, what they were thinking, because she has no idea what these people were thinking. Here we go, preamble of the Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Oh. Boy, that, that seems pretty straightforward, Mazzy. I mean, they were basically writing documents to make sure people could live freely. And they were pretty clean and clear about what they were saying. Well, then we had this other thing. It was this declaration. It was a very specific thing that it was declaring. It was declaring our independence. We even called it the Declaration of Independence. And they wrote some pretty thoughtful stuff in there too, Mazzy. Here we go. Sometimes it becomes necessary for a group of people to declare their independence from a government they used to be connected to. They have a right to do so under natural law, though they should respectfully lay out the reasons for the separation. It is obvious that all people have the right to equal treatment and that God gives people rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that can neither be taken nor given away. The only legitimate purpose of government is make sure that these individual rights are protected. And the only legitimate way for such governments to exist is for the people to consent to their existence. But if a government ever fails in its task to protect individual rights, the people have the right to alter or abolish it and create a new government based on whatever principles they think best. Boy, so they do seem pretty clear. It does seem like these people have thought this stuff through. They want to protect individual rights. They want to make sure that the government can't come for those rights. And they, they want to make sure that you have a recourse in case the government does that. But Mazzy has just no idea what these people were doing. Again, she's just, she is so clueless. She maybe never read a book, never went to school. So I thought, well, we'll continue with this education of Mazzy Hirono, uh, we also added amendments 
to these documents. Rather extraordinary because we wanted to really, really enshrine and ensure that these rights would not be taken away. We have something called the Bill of Rights. Uh, here's the First Amendment. I don't know if Mazzy's heard of this one. I mean, she just doesn't know what these people were thinking. Congress shall make no law representing an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Uh, then there's also the Second Amendment. I don't know if Mazzy's heard of this one. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, that, those were, of course, in the uh, Bill of Rights, the original Bill of Rights. Those are two of the first 10. And then uh, later on, the states added some more. Here's the 13th. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. And we've got one more for you, the 14th Amendment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Okay, so Mazzy Hirono, this is your life. You became a senator in the greatest country in the history of the world, which was founded by extraordinary people who are far better than you and far better than me, who thought through as many of the issues as humans have ever been able to think so that we could have a country 250 years later that has brought more freedom onto the world than would have ever been imaginable. But you just don't know what those people think. Now, what she's also doing there, very specifically, and she even said the word, she's attacking originalism. Okay, now originalism is the concept that we should always go back to exactly what the documents say, right? That you don't want to change the meaning of the documents over time because if you keep doing that, then over time the documents will actually mean nothing. So she's really against the idea of originalism and most of the left and Democrats and liberal judges are against originalism. They often want to change the documents to fit the moments of today. Uh, so we thought we'd dive into originalism a little bit. Uh, 60 Minutes did an interview with Antonin Scalia a couple of years back uh, discussing why he uh, is a constitutional originalist. Tonight, from 10 years ago, when we interviewed the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, he was a polarizing figure with a sharp wit and piercing intellect. He was a constitutional originalist, a philosophy he laid out for us. It's what, what did the words mean to the people who ratified the Bill of Rights or who ratified the Constitution? As opposed to what people today think it means. As opposed to what people today would like. But you do admit that values change. We, we do adapt, we move. That's fine, and so do laws change. Because values change, legislatures abolish the death penalty, permit same-sex marriage if they want, uh, uh, abolish laws against homosexual conduct. That's how the change in a society occurs. And that's how it's supposed to occur. That you look at what's in those founding documents and we are governed by what's in those things. But then we have something called the legislative process. And each state has its own les legislature. And each state can then make laws within that state. And then eventually, if they make a law that goes against the Constitution, that might work its way all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court might strike that down. Uh, but as he said right there, we have expanded rights through legislatures. So you can still be an originalist and say, hey, what's on this paper? This actually matters. These are the guidelines. And then if you want to do other things, you go to the states to do it. Now, of course, Anton and Scalia has since passed away and uh, he was hated by much of the mainstream media and he was hated by pretty much everybody on the left. Uh, there's a new guy that they hate right now. They really, really hate him. Uh, you may remember what Lori Lightfoot 
said about Justice Clarence Thomas just, uh, what was that, about two weeks ago? It involved the F word. Yeah, you remember that? Uh, and that he's a house, blah, 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 and all of those things. Well, he shares that exact same philosophy of originalism. Uh, here is uh, Justice Clarence Thomas responding to some of his critics. Steve oh, Croft of 60 Minutes asked Thomas about why he's still so quiet. The perception is where the critics will say it's because you're not smart enough or you're, you're too insecure or you're afraid of making a <laughs> fool out of yourself. Well, they make fools out of themselves with those kind of comments. Justice Marshall rarely asks questions. Justice Powell rarely asks questions. That's a personal preference. I certainly wouldn't do it to provide histrionics for uh, the media gallery or for other people or for critics. Critics will always be critics. Critics will always be critics, and the critics are always going after this guy. You can see in that interview, they're saying, oh, you don't, you don't say much. You, you write your briefs, right? You write your commentary after the decisions. People can understand your thinking very clearly, but you don't say much. I love the word histrionics. Like, I love the fact that he's like, I'm not a pontificator. I am not someone who just gets up there to talk just for the sake of talking and get the media attention and all of that. Uh, but this is so consistent. The left went from hating Antonin Scalia, now they hate Clarence Thomas, even though uh, they tell you that they're for all, all black people. But of course, what they mean by that is just black people who behave. And speaking of people who only like black people who behave, uh, back in 1991, when Justice Clarence Thomas, or to be Justice Clarence Thomas, was going through his hearings as to whether he was going to be confirmed or not, there was a guy by the name of Joe Biden. And Joe Biden basically led the Democrat charge to get rid of Clarence Thomas, make sure that he would not be a Supreme Court justice. It was very famously called a political lynching. Uh, Biden basically invented this. This is, this is really when, where now everything is so politicized, these hearings are so politicized. Before this, it was not. If you'd gotten, if the president nominated somebody, they pretty much just went through. It was Joe Biden. It really was Joe Biden and the Dems who switched uh, this whole situation and, and created it. Uh, it's called borking because it started when, uh, when Joe Biden attacked Robert Bork, who eventually did not get confirmed. Uh, but here's a little bit more of Thomas's response uh, to Joe Biden and the Dems way back when. You denied all of the allegations. Oh, absolutely. From day one, it didn't happen. I mean, so if somebody makes a broad allegation against you, what would you do? Ask him to prove it, I guess. Yeah. When it came time for him to publicly respond to the allegations, Thomas turned the tables on his interrogators and for all intents and purposes, ended the debate. This is a circus. It's a national disgrace. It is a high-tech lynching for uppity blacks who in any way deign to think for themselves. And it is a message that unless you kowtow to an old order, you will be lynched, destroyed, caricatured by a committee of the US, US Senate rather than hung from a tree. Why did you use that language? I mean, why a high tech lynching? If somebody just wantonly tries to destroy you, if somebody comes in and just drags you out of your house and beats the hell out of you, what is it? What do you want people to think about those allegations? What's, what is it important? I really, at think? this point, I think most well-meaning people understand it for what it was. It was a weapon to destroy me, clear and simple. I always say it, guys, but when you hear the truth, when you hear someone that honestly is saying what they believe, man, is it refreshing. And you look at that video from 1991 and that shot where the camera goes to Biden as he's basically saying, you, you led the charge on destroying me. Well, it's like Clarence Thomas is still here. Clarence Thomas is still cognizant and cogent and doing a fine job. And that is certainly far more than Joe Biden is doing right now. Uh, but you know, this is all sort of unfolding in real time. The craziness is unfolding in real time. And it's not just that they're sending these crazy Berkeley professors to uh, testify that men are women and that eight month fetuses are not life and all that. Uh, it's that their politicians are completely insane. You guys know uh, socialist multimillionaire Elizabeth Warren, senator, fake Native American senator from Massachusetts. Well, we played a video last week of her going nuts. I mean, really just going nuts, hysteria in her eyes 
uh, that there are too many crisis pregnancy centers. Now, crisis pregnancy centers, in contrast to abortion clinics, are places where women who are struggling with their pregnancy, maybe the, they don't have financial means, maybe their parents aren't happy, maybe they, they are with, with an abusive boyfriend, whatever their issue is related to being pregnant, they go there and then there is a series, these are nonprofit organizations, there are a series of ways that they can help them, either financially or medically or psychologically, et cetera, et cetera, so that they don't have to abort the child. This is, you would think, regardless of what side of the abortion thing you're on, you'd go, oh, this is actually pretty good. So maybe we could help these women. They could have the baby, either keep the baby or leave it for adoption, et cetera. You would think this is a good thing. Uh, but Elizabeth Warren, who last week went absolutely crazy because there's too many of these things, well, she's continuing. She just wants to kill poor people's babies. In Massachusetts right now, those crisis pregnancy centers that are there to fool people who are looking for pregnancy termination help outnumber true abortion clinics by three to one. We need to shut them down here in Massachusetts and we need to shut them down all around the country. You should not be able to torture a pregnant person like that. I mean, she is a sick fuck. I, I don't know how you can describe it in any other way. That somehow helping a woman have a baby is torture. Helping a woman decide not to have an abortion is fooling that woman. And then she wants to use the power of the state, the power of the government. We need to shut these places down. Lady, those aren't the places that are killing the babies. Those are the places trying to ensure that a baby can be brought into this world in a safe way to make sure that that woman doesn't have to make this horrible decision. She is absolutely insane, but she's exactly the perfect, the perfect progressive woke Democrat. Whether it is a professor at Berkeley who can't tell you what a man or a woman is and wants to abort an eight month child, or whether it is a socialist multimillionaire telling you, and these are poor people mostly who will go to these pregnancy centers. So what she is saying is, I want to ensure, yes, I am super rich. Yes, I send my kids to private school while I push public school on everybody else. Sure, I don't know what a man or a woman is, all of that stuff, uh, but I want to ensure that we don't trick women, we don't fool women, we don't torture poor, often black and Latina women to actually have a baby, because that's the worst thing. These are crazy people. They went, the Democrats went, man, I tried. I tried years ago. Remember why I left the left? Hey, Libs, are we doing anything here? They went from being the party of safe, legal, and rare. That used to be the, the standard Democrat position. If the Republican position was, we are pro-life, we do not want abortion, we want to re reverse Roe v. Wade and kick it back to the states, the position of the sane Democrat, which was a position that Chuck Schumer used to hold, that even Nancy Pelosi used to hold, and Joe Biden used to hold, and every sane Democrat before these last five years, we are the party of safe, legal and rare abortion. We don't celebrate abortion. We don't want eight month abortions. Let's have an honest assessment of when an abortion can be had or should be had or whatever related to all of that. Uh, that they've gone from that to pregnancy, pregnancy centers are domestic terrorist organizations. That's basically where they're at. These people are crazy. And let's not forget that video uh, that we showed you just a couple days ago, Joe Biden in 1988. Government should stay out of it. His actual uh, quote was not for it, not against it. Uh, but it continues, it continues with these people. It's not just that they don't know what boys and girls are. It's not just that they wanna kill as many poor brown children as possible. They also wanna pander to high hell. So Dr. Jill Biden, who's a doctor of what we have no idea, but as I've been saying, she clearly hasn't examined her husband. Uh, she gave a talk at a Latino or a Latina or a Latinx, depending on what you like to say, organization uh, two days ago. And if this isn't the most pandering nonsense you've ever heard, then I'd like to sell you a burrito. But we can't get those things on our own. Raul helped build this organization with the understanding that the diversity of this community, as distinct as the Bogodas of the Bronx, as beautiful as the blossoms of Miami, and as unique as the breakfast tacos here in San Antonio, <laughs> is your strength. 
The bodegas of the Bronx. The bodegas, lady. The bodegas. I lived in New York City. Every corner had a bodega. A bodega. We don't know what that is. And then, of course, it's so diverse. You, you brown people are so diverse. When I see you Hondurans and you Mexicans and you people from Guadalajara and wherever else you're from, I think of tacos. And you, you're a carne asada. And we got a pork taco over there and a fish taco. These people, they are such pandering buffoons. This is Hillary Clinton. Remember Hillary Clinton when she was on uh, Charlemagne the God, right? I can't keep calling him that. Can I get his real name? I don't want to call him Charlemagne the God. Um, anyway, he remember when she was running for president and he was like, what do you always keep on you? And she was like, hot sauce. It's always in my pocketbook. And it's like, what the flying, ugh, you people are just absolutely terrible. But I got to tell you guys, just totally joking aside, this morning, I was starving this morning. I woke up, I was just, you know, we wake up sometimes, you're just really, really hungry. And I was like, I'm going to go downstairs and make myself a delicious uh, breakfast taco, which I often do. And I go down there and I'm eating this most delicious breakfast taco. And then I had this like moment, I was like, Bleh. and I looked and it turned out I wasn't eating a breakfast taco. I was actually chewing Jose's hand. Jose is my Mexican gardener and he had come inside for some water and I saw him and I thought he was, a t and I was chewing on his hand and I put hot sauce on it and everything, it was nuts. So Jose, I know you're a big fan of the show and I'm watching and I apologize and I'm, I'm so sorry. Anyway, uh, I think we've got the warning for you because the crazy ladies of The View, there you go, what you're about to see, okay. The crazy ladies of The View, they chimed in on Dr. Jill Biden's comments. And look, I, I honestly, it's, it's a stupid thing that she said. Nobody, look, I don't think, well, she, I think she is racist in a way, right? Because even, because these progressives, they are racist because they've whittled everyone down to skin color and the pandering nonsense. Uh, but what, the reason I'm showing you The View right now, let's put the warning up again. I, I want people to really feel the warning. Um, the reason that I'm showing you this clip is that if Ted Cruz, who happens to be uh, of Latino descent, or Marco Rubio, or Donald Trump, or Ron DeSantis, made a comment like this, was like collecting their Latino people, but like tacos, the, the View and every other show for weeks would be saying, this is what they think of you Latino people. They think of you as tacos and burritos and chimichangas and everything else. Uh, but when it comes to Democrat do, Democrats doing these things, the entire media runs cover for them. Uh, Here's Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> these two ladies and the, for these two Latinas in the front <laughs> row are just crazy. They're her bogodas and they're just, they're, 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 oh, he, they're no. just, I mean, yeah, bo they, bodega is what she you, meant to so say. You, you think somebody might have read the speech beforehand and said, maybe you don't want to say it like this. Yeah. But this is, you know, I, I, I won't even say what I what it is because it's you know we all step in poo from time to time mm -hmm. and so this happens but this was really you can hear the people going what did she say yeah. exactly. and then that nervous laugh. Wait, did she just what? say bogota See, what's interesting about that is Whoopi knows that it's kind of messed up what Jill did there, right? She knows, and we're gonna show you more in just a second where she gets into it. But for her, when it comes to the Democrats saying something, they just stepped in poo, right? Do you think, again, if it, this was a Republican that said this, if this was Josh Hawley or Mike Lee that said, oh, he just stepped in poo. No, it would be this, he has unmasked himself. He obviously is a racist and thinks of uh, Latino people as tacos. Now, of course, the fact that there are masked people in their audience while they sit there unmasked. That's a completely separate point. Um, but okay, Whoopi, she was like sort of, like kind of almost getting there. And uh, well, she continued. Speaking about anyone, yeah. don't you avoid food related to yeah, people? That is tacos that whether it's skin color, well, you yeah, don't use you, food I would be upset people. if somebody said, you bring the chicken out in people. Yeah. Right. You know, I was, I, 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 don't, I don't know who, who uh, yeah. That's kind of what, you know, that's... <laughs> it was. Yeah, in it, case it was. you're not... This is what... It, was, it yeah. was a racial stereotype. that she, she used racial stereotypes. So I don't know who wrote that for her. But, and it was such an unforced error, right? Because if you, if you think about political affiliation, um, there is... Uh, Republicans are making the argument that there are more... Um, Hispanics that are now registering as Republican. And, and that, I, I don't know if that's true. Um, and I don't think it's true. So remember, when, when uh, Democrats do it, they step in poo or it's an unforced error. Would they be that gracious uh, if a Republican did it? I think not. I also want to comment on this thing that uh, Whoopi said about chicken. I love fried chicken. I really love fried chicken. I love watermelon. These are good things. These are good things. If you like the things, there's nothing racist about it. 
uh, right? Like I love fried chicken. I can't, I don't even know how you could associate that with racism in any way. I have watermelon in, in the fridge right now. You guys want some watermelon after the show? I don't associate that with anyone's skin color. When I went to Whole Foods and bought a watermelon, I bought the watermelon, I, enjoy, I thumped the watermelon, I enjoy watermelon. Um, so if you're associating like specific foods with specific people, sure, there's ethnic things, there's North, South, okay, people eat different things like this. But if you say to somebody, oh, you like fried chicken, and then if there's a racial connotation to that, first off, it, just you have a racial connotation just in and of itself is not racist if you like the thing, right? If you like the thing. Remember the episode of Seinfeld where uh, Jerry is dating this woman? He meets her on the phone and her name is Donna Chang and he thinks he's dating a Chinese woman. It turns out she's just a white girl from Long Island. And Elaine has to explain, they're all talking about, is this racist? Is this racist? And it's and Elaine's like, you know, it's not racist if you like the things. Everybody likes Chinese food. We've all just racialized everything to the point of complete stupidity. But speaking of complete stupidity, here's Joe Scarborough on MSNBC having a complete mental breakdown over a bunch of assorted stuff. Can you look... Oh, at the head-to-head -head matchup with Ron DeSantis, the great white hope, the guy that we hear every day, oh, from the Mr. right. Florida man. Florida man, from the right. Florida oh, man. he's going to win. Hey, Ron DeSantis, he's strong. <laughs> Ron DeSantis, he really showed the press. Oh, he really, he really showed the teachers. Oh, he's banning books now. He's really dumb, showing dumb. people who like the First Amendment. And we hear that two takeaways here, Joe, top of which is excellent impersonation typing as a Fox News dot com yeah. uh, correspondent there. Um, <laughs> I think that, first of all, I think there is a sense and we've talked about it during the show. There is a frustration among some Democrats toward this White House, a, a sense of eternal gratitude to Joe Biden for defeating Donald Trump in 2020. But thinking perhaps he's not the right guy to now defeat Trumpism and that maybe by issues. More Americans agree with where the Democrats are than where the Republicans are. The crackpots in Arizona that are lining up and that looks like are going to be nominated uh, to run there. They're conspiracy theorists. They're weirdos. They're freaks. Uh, uh, they're, they're um, you know, they are the most unelectable. Uh, and yet they've risen to the top in each of these Republican primaries. I know that Mitch McConnell has to be pulling his hair out because this should be easy. Republicans are making a lot harder than it should be. Well, I hate to tell you, Joe Scarborough, Joe Scarborough, who's taken every position on everything, often got everything wrong. Nobody knows what you honestly believe about anything. Uh, he's referring there to Blake Masters, uh, my friend who's been on the show, uh, who is going to be the next senator from Arizona. And he's also referring there to Carrie Lake, who's been on the show, who's going to be the next governor of Arizona, and he's calling them unelectable. And uh, mark my words, people, uh, they're both going to win and they're both going to deservingly win. Uh, and the idea that they're freaks and weirdos and, and unelectable and conspiracy theorists and all of these things uh, is completely insane. Blake, his platform is so freaking clean and clear and crisp on top of the fact that he's a good dude. He's exactly what we need in politics. He's a young guy with a family, three kids. He's a good father and a decent man. He was in the tech world for years. One of Peter Thiel's top guys. He did not need to go into politics, but he's going in because he wants to protect his state and protect this country. He wants there to be a safe border. He wants law and order and a whole bunch of other things. His Democrat opponent, by the way, Mark Kelly, uh, he wants to pack the Supreme Court. Uh, but you know, I get it. Joe Scarborough is just, is just sort of a nutbag and MSNBC is a televised mental institution. So why are these people losing it though? Why, why are they losing it? Whether it comes to gender or abortion or that everyone that's going to win is unelectable. Uh, it's because they're losing Americans and they almost sort of got it right there uh, on the view, the clip that I showed you previously where Sonny was like, oh, and it does look like Latinos are, uh, voting Republican now, as we know, uh, Myra Flores just crushed it in Texas to be the next Congresswoman in a, in a district that was a hundred years of Democrat control. They're losing everybody. Uh, and partly it's because nobody believes that Joe Biden is a functional president right now. Uh, but don't tell that to Joe Biden. Mr. President, what's your message to Democrats who don't want you to run again? They want me to run. Two thirds say they Read don't. The poll. Read the polls, Jack. You guys are all the same. That poll showed that 92% of Democrats, if I ran, would vote for me. A majority of Democrats say they don't want you to run again in no, 2024. 92% said if I did, they'd vote for me. I mean, he completely made that up. 
He completely made that up. We showed you a CNN poll from yesterday. CNN is not thrilled to have to show you a poll about a Democrat president not doing well. That I, Was it 96%, guys? Was it 96% of Democrats under the age of 30 do not want him to run? Uh, on top of the fact that just think about, you don't need polls on this. Just think about in your life, do you know anyone that really wants Joe Biden to run again? Do you know anyone that thinks Joe Biden's doing a particularly good job? The only two people so far that publicly I know want Joe Biden to run again are Pete, gay okay, Pete, because he wants to keep his job, and Kamala, because she wants to keep her job. But she's just lying all along because she wants him out so she can take over. And then why does she want to take over? Not because she thinks, not because she has a vision for the country or is competent or anything else, but the people pulling her strings, whoever those people might be, will be pretty thrilled to have a sort of more mindless buffoon uh, than Joe Biden in. So there's some interesting things here because there's such an incredible opportunity. There really is, guys. Like all of this craziness, I know it feels crazy and, and all the gender stuff and the race stuff and the media stuff, like it's a lot, but what it really also leads us to is that there's huge opportunity here, right? It really is the truth. So how are Republicans or conservatives or just relatively sane people, disaffected liberals, how are they going to save this thing? Uh, well, uh, Elon Musk, and you know, I often talk about Elon Musk because of the Twitter thing, but he's right in the center of things, I think, in, in many ways, not only because of his pedigree and, and the work that he does and Starlink and Tesla and the Boring Company and all of that stuff, uh, but because I think he represents a certain shifting of things. He represents a sort of Gen X guy who gets technology, who's not particularly political, but he's become political, someone who's mostly a liberal his whole life, but is now st starting to move to say a, a more, I would say a, like a post-liberal thing, something like that. Uh, so he had an interesting tweet two days ago uh, that I wanna read to you. Uh, he was responding to somebody else and he said, Trump would be 82 at the end of term, which is too old to be chief executive of anything, let alone the United States of America. If DeSantis runs against Biden in 2024, then DeSantis, DeSantis will win easily. He doesn't even need to campaign. Now, I put out a little Twitter thread uh, responding to Elon that really caught fire yesterday, and I think it gets to the heart of what's going on here, and I wanna show it to you. And, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this. And I know the locals community uh, is talking about it and it's blowing up sort of across, uh, across platforms right now. So I quote tweeted him, I said, the problem is that Biden isn't running, meaning isn't running again. He served his purpose. As for Trump, he has to decide whether he wants to be kingmaker or go for gold in a system which will never allow him to have it. Either way, Elon is paving the way for cowardly libs to vote DeSantis, which is good. I continued, in a follow-up tweet, Elon Musk said that he felt Trump was a bull in a China shop, and that's true, but there is no metaphor of a panther in a China shop who slyly lets himself in and knocks off a few selective items. I made that point to Eric Weinstein in 2017, and then there's Eric uh, referring to my comment on that, and I think I've got one more tweet here. My hope is that Trump and DeSantis will work it out privately. There is a huge opportunity to fix the country right now, and there are very few voters who can actually be swayed. But the non-insane libs, Bill Maher, Barry Weiss, Joe Rogan, could probably move a lot of people to DeSantis. My guess is that the Maher, Weiss, Holly Weird crowd will go down with the damn ship, but Rogan must types will go to DeSantis. The latter is a way bigger group of people. Regardless, the question still remains, what does Trump really want? So the reason I wanted to read this to you because it's not, it, it, it sort of caught fire online, but I think, I think I'm getting to the heart of it and it's, it's why I end up talking about Elon Musk so often, Bill Maher so often, the ex-lib so often and all that. Because if you think about the election this way, if, or you just think about America this way, the most people at this point, the huge swath of people have made their mind up. So let's say, let's, if we're to believe that 81 million people voted for Joe Biden and 75 million voted for Trump, and let's not factor in a certain amount of people die, you get a certain amount of new voters. Okay, let's say those are roughly what the numbers are, right? Well, how many people that voted for Trump out of those 75 million are gonna be, look at what's happened in this country and be like, I'm either voting for Biden, who is not gonna run. Biden's obviously not running, and he may not, my guess is he doesn't make it to the end of the four years. But how many of them are gonna be like, I'm voting for Biden, or whatever, whoever's following up Biden, be it Kamala Harris or anyone else that they throw in there, Gavin Newsom, like, boy, the policies of the Democrats have really been good over these years. The high tax stuff, the locking us in our house stuff, the inflation stuff, all these things by the Democrats have been good. There's almost no argument that anyone 
who voted Trump or is a conservative or a Republican would be like, oh, that thing is better. Now, there is an argument, obviously, that people who just had Trump derangement syndrome and just could not get there on Trump or had completely legitimate reasons not to like Trump or whatever it might be, that they might go, boy, after four years of Biden and the Dems and big government and big taxes and lockdowns and COVID, and that, that I am just gonna vote the other way. I actually, I've started waking up a little bit and you know I care more about states' rights and I want lower taxes. There's definitely an argument that people could move that way. Okay, so that's one piece of this. But the other piece of this is if you take those two groups, right? And let's say the bulk of those people aren't gonna move. Who, who are the people that could move right now? Well, it's basically the non-woke liberals. That's why I reference those people. That's why I talk about the Bill Mars and the Rogans uh, often, because it's the people who should at this point fully get it. Those are the only people, and they, they're just representatives of people, right? So they're just avatars in this equation, but it's, it's you watching this, or it's your brother or cousin or friends or coworkers, these, these people who always thought they were liberal their whole lives, who may be old school liberals, I wrote a book about it, who must now come around. I think that's the only voting block in America right now that there's actual fluidity to, where they actually might say, hey, I've had enough of the Democrat party and I'm going to move. So that's why I think it's so, so uh, important to talk about because those are the people that can move. If you only go to the base all the time, if you only talk about the base, then you're not gonna move a lot of people. I would say all that couched in, it's why the DeSantis thing makes sense. All of the people who had the Trump derangement stuff, it's like, well, they didn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily the policies. People remember that the, the country was in good shape, the economy was doing well and all of those things. So it's like DeSantis, he's fought the machine, he fights the media, it's all the stuff that Joe Scarborough was making fun of him for and the only reason Joe Scarborough is making fun of him is because he knows he's actually accomplishing things. Um, but he has the policy, we know he knows how to staff properly um, and he doesn't have all the baggage that Trump had. But all of that being said, uh, Trump has to decide what he wants to do. And that really is the X factor in this entire thing, right? That is the one piece of this that's floating in the ether that until Trump officially says he's gonna do it, or maybe Trump's gonna wait to the midterm, see that the Republicans are gonna crush it, see that DeSantis obliterates the opponents. There are basically no opponents here in Florida and wins this tremendously or hugely, as he would say. And then he's like, you know what? I will support the guy and I'll go out there and I'll campaign for him and everything else. So that's kind of that's kind of where we're at. So again, you could to wrap this whole thing up, it's like liberals, if you just look at it, they used to think that abortion was safe, legal, and rare. That was the sane thing. And now it's basically pregnancy centers equate to Al-Qaeda. So if you're a sane liberal, if you're a sane liberal, where are you gonna go? Where are you gonna go? Well, it's on you. All right, hang tight for the cold close. Let me get to a couple comments real quick. Uh, comment, or, or, at 100% USA says, bacteria on Mars is life but a heartbeat in the womb isn't. Yeah, it's one of those ones where it's just like, you can get them so easily on all of this stuff, right? Front page of every newspaper tomorrow, if we found some little microscopic something somewhere. Life, everything we know about science has changed. We're not alone. Heartbeat, eight month baby, nothing, it's nothing. Amy says, modern feminists are erasing women one pronoun at a time. Yeah, they, the, the modern feminist movement is a complete grift and sham that has nothing to do with protecting women or girls, absolutely. And Steel Ray says, apparently someone did not read the Federalist, uh, the Federalist Papers, Senator Hirono. Yeah, I, by the way, I really enjoyed reading those things. It's like, isn't it refreshing to know those people did know what they were thinking about and those documents have lasted a long time? Hirono, you are just a footnote in history because nobody is gonna remember you other than to clown you. Uh, but the idea that, oh, we can't imagine to possibly ponder, to know what those old people used to think about stuff, just completely ridiculous. Uh, guys, reminder, tomorrow, we've got a regular show in the morning, but then tomorrow night, I will be doing a Rubin Report episode live at the Miami Improv. You can go to daverubin.com slash events. Couple seats left, Christina Pushaw, Ron DeSantis' press secretary will be joining me. Uh, Lisa Booth from Fox News, my buddy Dave Raboy. Uh, Patrick Bet David, part one is up on Rumble and Locals, uh, Rumble and YouTube right now, full things up over on Locals. And uh, that's all I got for you today. Uh, and just remember guys, if, uh, if Joe Biden doesn't make it, at least we've got Kamala. Elections matter. When you win an election, you get to set the rules. How can you win with Russian interference though? 
That's the that's real what thing. I'm scared about no, in 2020. But, but rightly. Because right. I think he's an illegitimate president that didn't really win. So how do you, you know, fight against that in 2020? You are absolutely right. So, again, as a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, I will tell you that we should believe exactly what the intelligence community has told us, which is Russia did interfere in the election of the president of the United States in 2016.